It has been a common claim by politicians that firearms ownership in Canada is not a right, it's just a privilege. But is this claim true? Let's have a look. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be investigating a claim about the gun control conversation, which has always bothered me. It's a claim that has been frequently touted by many politicians and gun control groups. They have said on a great many occasions that there is no Second Amendment in Canada, that there is no right to firearm ownership. And on top of that, they make the claim that not only is it not a right, it's merely just a privilege. Gun ownership in Canada, in this country, is a privilege and not a right. In Canada, gun ownership is a privilege, not a right. That's not a right that you have in the Constitution or anywhere else. But how true is that? It's one thing for politicians to make that claim, and it's another for our courts to have bought into it as well. I've been going over the CCFR's court case recently, and in paragraph 524, this claim showed up again. But this time it came from a judge. And she said, The Ontario Court of Appeal found, based on the jurisprudence, there is no constitutionally protected right to possess and use any firearm. This is a privilege. So you expect it from politicians because, for some reason, they are permitted to lie in order to rationalize their viewpoints. However, judges and the courts are not, or at least they're not supposed to, which is what makes this extremely disturbing. The judge in this case is the Honorable Justice Kane. So where does she get the information to make this claim? Well, she gets it from the ruling of the Crown versus Montague. So this case happened back in 2010, and it's somewhat famous in the firearm community, as it's the case that really was like the nail in the coffin for firearms rights in Canada. Montague cites the Crown and Hasselvonda for this information, but it's common knowledge that there is no Second Amendment or its equivalent as stated in the Canadian Charter or the Bill of Rights. However, what's much less known is that one of the constitutional documents in the Canadian Constitution is actually the English Bill of Rights from 1689. And this English Bill of Rights has a right to bear arms in it, although it does come with some caveats. The most staunch supporters of Canadian firearms rights will often cite this bill. However, in the 2010 case of Montague, this point was brought up and it did not sway the Ontario Court of Appeal to give a favourable ruling. Nor was it a strong enough argument to get an appeal at the Supreme Court of Canada. Now, you might be of the mind that our rights are God-given and the government can't take them away. Or maybe you think that the ability to have firearms is just a fundamental human right or whatever the case may be. And you might even be right. However, Montague shows us that at the very least we have no legal right to firearms. And for what it's worth, I think I kind of even agree with the court on this point. I don't think we have the legal right to firearms in Canada either. Now whether or not I think we should is a very different story, which I will definitely be making a video on at some point in the future. But for the sake of today's video, we are going to be operating on the premise that there is no such legal right to firearms in Canada. So then where does this idea of firearms being a privilege come from? Well in Montague they cite another case. Paragraph 9 of the Crown versus Wiles. In paragraph 9 they have this to say. The sentencing judge gave insufficient weight to the fact that possession and use of firearms is not a right or freedom guaranteed under the Charter, but a privilege. Not only that, but this case goes so far as to say that all weapons, not just firearms, are a privilege. The word privilege actually shows up seven times in this ruling, but nowhere here does it cite anywhere else to support this phrase, nor can I find any other older court case which fully explains why firearms are actually a privilege. The ruling here by the Supreme Court in Wiles says that not only do you not have the right, but you don't even have the freedom. It's, it's just a privilege. Now courts and precedents aside, there is also the issue of Section 91 of the Criminal Code. Section 91 says every person commits a crime who has a firearm without the appropriate license or registration. Now this wording could be very easily interpreted to mean that all firearm possession is explicitly illegal, except with special exemption from the government, and therefore it is a privilege granted to you by the government which you would not ordinarily have. Which means, ultimately, the government and the gun control types are actually kind of correct for once here. At the very least from a legal perspective, firearm ownership is just a privilege in Canada. And there appears to be even some legal precedent to back up their claim precedent which was given by the Supreme Court of Canada itself. That being said, I recognize the council has made a decision, but given that it's a stupid ass decision, I've elected to ignore it. The claim laid out in Wiles, as damning as it is, has no apparent source precedent or legislative citations, so I can't really determine where this idea of privileges come from. However, it is the idea of privileges itself that I take issue with, so I would be challenging these origins anyway, even if I knew for sure what they were. And this concept of privileges has two fatal flaws in it, both of which are based on violations of the Canadian Charter. First off, the easiest thing to prove, and just to get the ball rolling, 
is a violation of Section 26 of the Charter. Now, Section 26 is one of the lesser known charter rights in Canada, but it essentially says that just because something isn't explicitly covered in the Charter as a right or freedom, that isn't to be interpreted as evidence that said right or freedom just doesn't exist. So the underlying rationale in Wiles would be directly a Section 26 charter violation. In Wiles, the Supreme Court implies that it is not a right or freedom granted under the charter, and therefore it's just a privilege. And Section 26 exists to say that this isn't evidence enough to show that it is merely just a privilege. This really is an open to interpretation, as Section 26 was expressly designed and intentionally designed to prevent this exact circumstance from happening. And there's even legal precedent before the charter was signed in 1982, which indicates that firearm ownership, at least in part, had some form of legal right in Canada. In the case of Delmonico versus the Director of Wildlife in 1969, it was ruled that the grant of a license may be a privilege, but the ongoing renewals and ownership was something akin to a right. And this was further backed up in 1979 and upheld in the appeal of the Crown versus Abel. In back-to-back -back decisions, I might say, Judges ruled that a Canadian had both the right and the privilege to her firearm. Her fully automatic, standard capacity Sten submachine gun, I might add. This ruling was based on earlier precedent and Section 35 of the 1970 Interpretation Act, which was directly based on pre-existing common law. That being said, <laughs> I'm certainly no lawyer. These rulings predate the Charter, and they don't carry the same weight that they once did. Section 26 is strong enough to say that the Charter wouldn't override these precedents on its own, but I don't have the decades worth of training or experience to really know if there are any other such laws or precedents detailing exactly why this is legitimately only a privilege now. But such cases do likely exist, and it would mean that this is not a violation of Section 26. And therefore, I'm also going to be challenging the idea itself under Section 1 of the Charter. Section 1 essentially says that you have no rights or freedoms in Canada. It says that all of your rights and freedoms are subject to government rule. Well, <laughs> I mean, actually, it doesn't really say that at all, but it's regularly interpreted by the courts to be read that way. What it actually says is that your rights and freedoms are subject, quote, only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society, end quote. Now, that's all still a little wordy, so let's remove the unrelated parts of that. We already agree on the premise that you have no rights to firearms in Canada, at least for the purposes of this video, and we are already discussing laws, and this has nothing to do with democracy. And what's left out of that is actually pretty easy to digest. So essentially it says, freedoms are subject to only such reasonable limits as can be demonstrably justified in a free society. Now, just to be clear, this is not a rewording of Section 1. This is merely the parts of Section 1 which are going to be engaged by my argument and which have been highlighted for additional clarity. So what I'm going to be arguing is this. Privileges are not permissible in a free society. Now, not just firearms as privileges, but privileges of any kind whatsoever. So to start, we need a definition. Uh, we all kind of loosely know what it means to be free, but what is a privilege? The gun control types always say that you have no need to it and no right to it, and therefore firearms are just a privilege. So let's take a look at what that would really mean in action when we apply it to a different subject. So a few months ago, one of our brilliant politicians declared that you have no legal right to your children. Well, I'd like to say, first of all, there's no such thing as parental rights in Canada. There are parental responsibilities. Okay, so according to the government, you have no right to your children. Would you die without your children? A lot of people may feel like they would, or they may say that they would, you know, metaphorically or spiritually or whatever. But realistically, you wouldn't literally die without your children. Therefore, your children are also not a need. So if you don't have any right to your children, and you have no need for your children, then by the exact same logic, your children are just a privilege in the eyes of the government. You're only allowed to have them because the government has given you their permission in order to have and keep them. Is that a society you want to live in? Does that sound like a free society to you? In order to live in a free society, freedom must be the starting point, or the underlying virtue, and then we create sensible laws to restrict it from there. In a free society, the government wouldn't have powers of permission, only powers of restriction. And this is where rights come in. Rights are there to limit how much the government can restrict your freedom. In a free and just society, laws would exist to protect us from each other, but rights would exist to protect us from the government. However, in a tyrannical society, government rule and authority is the starting point. Any rights and freedoms you may have are given to you by the state. Your freedom, if you have it at all, is something which can be granted or revoked at any time. 
Your rights can be limited any time they become inconvenient for the government. Laws are there to control you, and rights, if they're listed at all, aren't even worth the paper they're written on. So which of those two systems better describes the country that you live in? Now, I know that sounds a little dramatic, but I do want to point out that the Canadian government quite literally states that them having the ability to limit your fundamental rights and freedoms is, quote, an innovation in human rights law, end quote. <laughs> innovation, you know, an advancement, an evolution. It's somehow an improvement of your rights that the government now has the power to completely violate your rights. A power, by the way, which didn't exist before the ironically named Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And who, might you ask, decided that your rights and freedoms should become subject to government rule? <laughs> I don't know, but that certainly sounds like something Trudeau would do. To truly live in a free society, our rights and freedoms must exist not because of our government, but rather in spite of our government. If our government can treat our freedom as privileges and our rights as flexible, then our rights and freedoms are essentially optional. And how would that be any different than a tyrannical society like a dictatorship? Dictatorships also treat their subjects' rights and freedoms as optional. In fact, that's kind of the defining feature of a dictatorship. So, like, we always hear the term tyranny paired with dictatorships, but dictatorships aren't certainly not the only kind of tyranny which exists. Dictatorships aren't even inherently tyrannical. They just always seem to play out that way in practice. In theory, the most benevolent and wise ruler could give their citizens absolute rights and total freedom. Now, likewise, freedom is often conflated with democracy. Democracies aren't inherently free. The ability to vote for who your master will be is not an indication of freedom as it means you still have a master. Dictatorships are tyranny by the individual, and democracy is tyranny by the majority. And freedom is the ability to exist and make choices independent of that tyranny, regardless of its source. And this is an understanding which the Canadian Charter even notices. Section 1 mentions both a free and democratic society. It understands that freedom and democracy are not the same thing, which is why it makes specific mention of both. And as we've seen plenty of in recent years, democracy can be very easily weaponized to destroy freedom. However, freedom entirely permits democracy to exist. And even if freedom were to destroy democracy, wouldn't that be a good thing? To loosely paraphrase one of Winston Churchill's famous quotes, he said, democracy isn't the best system, it's just the best system we know of. And I'm sure our society is certainly not the first one to have thought that about itself. So if one ever did have to choose between freedom and democracy, freedom should be the more desirable value. This claim is also clearly supported and understood by the Charter in Section 15. The inherent tyranny of the democratic majority is to be limited in order to protect the rights and freedoms of the minority from discrimination. Democracy alone is insufficient grounds to violate the rights or freedoms of an individual, according to the Charter. Now, freedom shouldn't be limitless, and I'm certainly not advocating for that. Society couldn't function as a society with absolute unfettered freedom. And a good example of this is prison. Prison is demonstrably justified in a free society, provided its laws are just. There can be no doubt that freedom can also be misused to violate the rights and freedoms of others. And therefore, there must be a system of punishment for those who misuse their freedom in this fashion. In a free society, prison exists to protect the rights and freedoms of that society. And therefore, it should also be unjust, in a free society, to write laws to persecute individuals who have not actually violated the rights and freedoms of others. As counterintuitive as this sounds, prison is entirely permissible in a free and just society because, in my opinion, it constitutes an enhancement and an expansion of freedom in that society. So to be clear, I'm certainly not advocating for anarchy here. And I'm not advocating for infinite freedom. What I'm advocating for is this. Privileges are not possible in a free society. To declare that you have privileges in a free society is to say that your freedom itself is the privilege. And if you don't quite get that, let me show you what I mean. So in this video so far, we've discussed four different degrees of existence in our world. You've got needs, rights, freedoms, and privileges. But what do these terms really mean? Well, if your needs aren't being met, you're probably dead or dying, unfortunately. <laughs> if your needs are being met, but you have no rights, you're probably either a soldier or a slave. If your needs and rights are being met, but you aren't free, you're probably either a child or a prisoner. If your needs and rights are being met and you are free, then you're likely a citizen. And if you're in any of these other categories, you are not a citizen, you are a subject. Subjects can lead vastly different lives based on their individual circumstances, 
but the common denominator across all subjects is that they are not free. To varying extremes, soldiers, slaves, children, and prisoners all require permission from their superiors before they are allowed to think, speak, or do. And their superiors may well give them a great deal of freedom and autonomy, or they may not. This is what it means to have privileges. A privilege is defined as a special right or advantage granted to someone or a particular group. Now, in the context of a free society, it's kind of hard to imagine a more special right or advantage than freedom. The, like, um, or super freedom, I guess? Yet, our laws would claim that such a thing is possible. However, it's very easy to point out what a privilege is to somebody who is a subject. Freedom is that privilege. If you are a subject, then your rights and or freedoms are viewed as a privilege. It's also true then that having privileges is what makes you a subject. Prisoners are granted privileges which are subject to their warden's decrees. Children are granted privileges which are subject to their parents' wishes. Soldiers are granted privileges which are subject to their commander's orders. And slaves are granted privileges which are subject to their master's whims. You cannot be a free citizen if you have privileges which are subject to anyone, including the government. They're just like, they're mutually exclusive concepts. They don't work. If my ability to think or speak or do requires the express consent or permission from anyone else, then I am not free. And that's because freedom is expressly the idea that I should not require consent or permission from anyone in order to think or speak or do. For the government to say that you have privileges, that would have to mean that you're only allowed to think or speak or do simply because they are giving you their consent or their permission for you to do so there can be no other interpretation. And thus, in accordance with section one, privileges of any kind cannot be demonstrably justified in a free society. Privilege is a term of tyranny and must never be used in the governance of free citizens in a free society. And therefore, firearm ownership in Canada is neither a right nor is it a privilege. It has been, and always should be, a freedom. A freedom limited to only the same rights and laws afforded to every other Canadian citizen. Lawful firearm owners should be afforded equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination, to be secure from unreasonable search and seizure, as well as to be assured their liberty in accordance with all the principles of fundamental justice. Our minority group has been repeatedly denied all of these things in Canada because of the faulty claim that the Charter doesn't guarantee us these rights. While it's true that no part of the Charter explicitly gives us any firearm rights in Canada, a correct and responsible interpretation of the Charter should guarantee our freedom to do it anyway. So, I'd like to thank you all for watching. What do you think? Should gun ownership be a right, a freedom, or just a privilege? And do you think I'm overreacting? Or are you also of the mind that our society doesn't really look particularly free anymore? If you'd like to see more firearm news or related content, please check out one of these videos. And all that being said, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Montague cites the Crown and Hasselwander, Hasselwander? Hasselwander? In paragraph 9 of the Crown versus Wiles, Willies? Wiles? Willies? <laughs> in the case of, wow, what the hell, what the, Del Monico? <laughs> Del Monico. I should have practiced up on some of these case names before I started. I recognize the council has made a decision, but given that it's a stupid-ass decision, I've elected to ignore it. <laughs> Let's go.